more interesting thing, yes! Now look, in hindsight, uh, looking back on this duel and people who watch this show in the future, they're gonna be like, of course she didn't die. Like, nothing was set up for her to die in this duel, but you don't understand. As someone who has been watching this show from day one, as someone who watched the last Yu-Gi-Oh, which was basically about its female character, and then watched them dump that, you have no idea how good it was to see that they didn't just take the easy way out and get rid of her as they did two seasons past. And what was so great about it was that they kind of came up with some more interesting ways to present this. Like, I had a hot minute at the end there where it kind of felt like he was going to take away both of them. Like, when they're both in the water cyclone and they're both uh, on the ground and they're like, we'll be together forever. That I thought was maybe a little much... I feel like in a world where both of you have died twice before and been brought back like two days later, not even, like mostly just a couple hours later, I feel like you shouldn't really have that big an impact. Uh, but I think it worked. I think they really were trying to play it till the end there that she would go too. And so when it does actually happen that it's just Akira, you kind of do feel like you're in part of the scene, even though it was completely set up to just get rid of him. And I felt like it was set up in a way that I thought really worked for what they were going for here, and that being that idea that for Aoi, this was her chance to protect Akira. This was her chance to be the one to take charge, to sort of stop the bad guy and be the hero. When you look at the duel, what I thought was really clever was most of the actual good cards used that really contributed to the game state were the Marincises. Now again, some of you may be saying, well, duh, Marincises are what they're going to use to sell sets, goddammit. Yeah, again, that's all completely true, but from a narrative perspective, it sets up really good this idea that Aoi is the character who's just trying to do the right thing. She's trying to be there for her brother. She's trying to help her friend. She probably does, to an extent, want to protect the people who work at Soul Technologies. And also, what's very important, we'll get into this in a little bit, she also wants to be the person who can reason with I. To be like, you don't have to do this, we understand. We talked about that a lot last week. But what was sort of great about everything this week is that it was an insanely nihilistic feeling. Like, not only... Did she not save Akira? She also couldn't get to I. And essentially from what we see from the preview, and this is genius, the preview is just completely focused on showing how everything is now collapsing because of this. It'll be fascinating to see how they handle Aoi maybe potentially having this burden on her shoulders, because that's where the episode leaves her at. You even kind of get a glimpse of that in the preview, that last shot of her with her eyes kind of glistening like that. It's just this sort of like... I don't know what to do, and that's a great feeling to put into it. The other thing I love about this whole thing is I at the end there. Like, if you thought about things from the perspective of, of course, Aoi had to win, I suspected the idea was that this would where we would get our first hint, I hasn't gone completely evil, or Akira would make a self-sacrifice. They went with a pretty scary way to do it. I, and I know a lot of people think this too, think I pretending to be the big villain is a complete load of bull. And I think that is still the direction we're going in. But the way he sort of says that at the end there, like, I want you to feel the pain. Like, I want you to know you couldn't save the person who matters most to you. That's beyond just, like, over-the-top villainous. That is cruel. That is sadistic. And it comes at the fact that she was trying to help him. She wanted to do something to be the better person so badly and this is how she gets treated like it really is a sad cruel way to get rid of Akira like it's also smart because um, Yu-Gi-Oh has had this problem and a lot of shonen franchise have this problem of when characters can just come in and out through a revolving door it's sort of hard to make it matter when they die unless you come up with a way to make it feel poignant and I feel like almost just skipping over the fact that he's gone like the point of the scene is not that Akira is dead the point of the scene is that I wants to be cruel that he wants to hurt Aoi that he wants to put her down this path 
like that's really what makes the scene interesting and what will hopefully be what propels things through the next episode and so on and so forth. I feel like in the preview, the reason they don't show Aoi towards the end there is because they want you to feel that sense of impending doom that's now going on. You see the other three main characters staring at the screen helpless. You see I opening a giant door. You see the androids all over Soul Technology, all the people leaving. Like all that and when it's just kind of put through that lens of this girl's probably going to blame herself, it makes for a really interesting and compelling drama. I also like the way everyone reacts to Akira's death. Because the idea is that Akira, the whole time, even though he went about it in a different way, still wanted to reason with Ai, still wanted to reach Ai's good side. Now, as we discussed, he takes a very different angle from it than Aoi, but he still tried, and I like that idea that everyone felt that. Everyone felt like Akira was trying to do the right thing. And that's how the season kind of built him up too. Just like with Aoi, Akira was just trying to help everyone he could and do the right thing. And that's what he, how he acted in season two and through a lot of season one. So when you see him go like this after being the, to all accounts, normal guy who just kept putting himself on the limb to protect people, to see him be the one who goes, you kind of feel it when everyone just kind of takes it to heart. Like, they could have done it with any of the other characters and be like, oh, now is when you cross the line. But when you take out the guy who was sort of kind of in the older brother role for not just Aoi, but in a weird way was kind of written to be that for every character he interacted with, rather intentional or just kind of the way it was acted or directed on the spot or just kind of what fans have taken from it. Uh, when you have, when you make that the character death that pushes everybody, it kind of feels earned, like it really did. Uh, and then there's just the duel itself. I brought up about the way the cards were used, but just in general, I really dig the way I plays his deck. I really like the fact that he relies on his consistently good cards. He relies on Templar. Uh, he's using that Phoenix card a lot, which is really cool. I hope we get to see the XCs and the Synchro again because I thought they were pretty neat. The Earth one doesn't really matter, but what I like here about him using the water one, if you look, the water one is the most monstrous looking. This is the biggest contrast because water is, of course, Aqua, who was the kindest and the nicest, the one I cared about the most. But by having it that the water one is the most monstrous, and of course, again, make the argument, it's a water creature, of course you make it a sea monster, but by making it that's the one that goes the monstrous, it's meant to be a visual metaphor for I throwing away the last bit of his kindness, the last bit of his humanity, or obviously he's an artificial son, if you guys get what I'm getting at. But the thing is that it's inter it's also interesting that it happens to Aoi, because throughout the show, from like day one, I has sort of shown to have this kind of care for Aoi. If that I, I don't really know how the writers intended it, but like, first thing he says when it comes up to her in her premiere episode, he's like, by all accounts, she is beautiful. Another time, she called him a cute, he called her a cutie. Uh, there was a lot of instances, like whenever something bad happened to her, he was often shown to be the first to react. I can't help but wonder if this was meant to be the setup for that. The idea that just in one foul swoop, he got rid of all his humanity. It's one thing to go after Go, it's one thing to go after Queen, but here he's going after someone who he seems, again, I'm looking for the right word here, kind of to, at the very least, give someone of a crap about and also to do it using the card that represented the one of his fellow Ignises he cared the most about, that's a very nice, clever visual metaphor. The, the only gripe I have about this duel is I feel like all three of the duels Aoi lost up to this point, I, I know she lost against Playmaker 2, but I'm talking about the big climactic ones, it sort of feels like they do this thing where she actually does this logical, complex strategy that should work and then loses to some bullshit card no one will remember in five minutes. Um, I think that's just sort of the problem when you have a character who plays a actual competitive deck. And obviously, we'll have to wait and see how the Marincises do here. Uh, I'll definitely say something in the future if they do something big, but Trickstar were obviously a tier 1 deck and floated in the tier 1.5 range for like, what? almost two years. Um, so yeah, I think it's just sort of this weird thing of she has a deck she plays effectively and functionally to how it's used in the real world, so it just kind of feels weird when it should totally make sense, but ultimately, I get it. And above all else, I thought they really did a good job of setting this whole thing up. 
and it really is a clever sort of sad way to handle your character and I quite liked it and I'm really fascinated to see where they're taking everybody like this is the first time in a while I care about the character story arc and I also care about the main story arc because I want to know what's behind those doors just watch it somebody's porn collection but anyways yeah tell me what you thought about this episode in the comment section below uh, are you still rooting for I do you are you happy I yeah, always still here could you not have cared either way all are totally logical perspectives and last but not least we have the TCG question of the week it's here boys and girls the world's ban list this will be the ban list that they use specifically for the world championship uh, now I'll link it below but what's sort of interesting and kind of controversial is that this list doesn't adopt our list into it you see normally the world's ban list is a combination of both the TCG and the OCG list as well as excluding anything that hasn't been released to all territories so it's kind of this list sort of based more around how can you build a deck in a short amount of time okay several weeks is a decent amount of time how well can you build a deck with all these restrictions and how well can you play with it in a tournament setting against the best of the best that to me is the true challenge of war of worlds and to me has always been very interesting but under this list it only follows the OCG most recent list which means all the stuff that just got taken away salad um, Geist, um, the, the Phantom Knight, no, wait, I think that still doesn't work. You get my point. <laughs> um, but the thing is that it's sort of interesting because it means that we'll sort of be playing in this pseudo last format that the OCG is used to. So do you think it's a good thing or should they have just adopted both lists and see what people really do when they have a super limited tier one card pool to pick out of? I would have liked to have seen that. I was actually really hoping to see what that would have done, but I still love watching Worlds. Uh, so tell me about that below. And as always, click to like, click to subscribe, and join me next week for 16-year-old girls sad that everything around her is crumbling.